don't be intimidated by the fact that like my family was in the movie business and that got me jobs as a PA you know production assistant but it, it didn't get me a job as a director it, once I wanted to be that like nobody paid any attention to me you know I could get jobs you know getting coffee but um, after that I was nobody you know and nobody was that powerful that they could I, I didn't even do it um, it was just too embarrassing I guess I wasn't writing when I could have been giving scripts to producers that I was PAing for I just I went ended up going to graduate film school at Columbia and that was where I started so you PAed first and then you went back to graduate school yeah I did mean, you feel like graduate school was helpful or very because after I um, worked on movies as a PA and I did an editing room job and I took s I graduated NYU but I'd only gone to film school really for a year and I really didn't know what I was doing and I couldn't get a job I could work my way up in an editing room I suppose that way but I wanted to write and direct and I was writing scripts that I guess were pretty I didn't think they were really good and I didn't know what I was doing and I, I needed a short film and I was able to go to graduate school and then out of that I got an agent and it was it was pretty independent from my movie business upbringing not that I'd be ashamed to say it helped me because you should take help wherever you can <sighs> but that's very true um, absolutely um, you know um, talking about it just reminded me Winnie and I to always do a little <laughs> easy homework <laughs> of pulling things off the internet yeah you know and I didn't win the independent spirit award either oh did you doctor that on the internet? No. Did so it say that I did? No. But there's all I, kinds I of in, misinformation. I, I was nominated. Like the fact that Barack Obama is not a, a Muslim. Muslim. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Right, exactly. <laughs> there's other types of misinformation on the internet. Sometimes yes, the internet is, is wrong. It said I acted in movies that I never acted in. <laughs> um, like but you have this great quote here um, that I'd love to talk about a little bit. It push, push my buttons to say you want to be a director is to risk sounding pretentious, obnoxious, or arrogant. And I think women are more fearful of sounding that way than men are. So, do you have any? Never mind. <laughs> um, I just, I just, you know, I to have a film student say like, I, I just knew people. I had friends who we'd go to a party and someone would say, Oh, what are you doing? It's like I'm a director. It's just like, oh my God, it just, um, you know, they directed a short. And it just seemed really obnoxious, male or female. But I think, what? But no, it's How did you get I past I that to, s to yeah. be a director? Yeah. There, I didn't say it. I mean. You didn't say it, but deep down you wanted to be it, and you. Not at first, no. I don't think I had any inkling to be a director. I just wanted to be a writer. So what so switched, what happened? Um, I guess it. Columbia so I thought I'd be a writer and then um, at Columbia they make you take directing classes and you direct uh, many vi many videos of scenes and have a chance to explore and make mistakes and stuff and I found I was good at it and really enjoyed it and it w I felt really comfortable doing it so it was that program that encouraged me to want to be a director I would never think I, uh, no I think the quote is very true I think it's that they're undermining to females? No, no it's not no, undermining, but it's no. there's a certain. I think um, it's true. I think you're right. I think as a most women, maybe it's changing. I hope it's changing for a younger generation of women. But that you should be nice, and it's not nice to go around saying, "Well, I can tell a lot of people what to do." My right. brother once said, "You'd be a good director because you're so you like to boss people right. around." I was like, "That's true." I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to pay people to have to listen to me. That would be good. Um, yeah. And the one time I directed, I really did like that part of it. Yeah. Um, I, no, know, I mean, I like the whole thing, but what, what, I, what I really liked was, and, it, and this probably is a mark of my inexperience or I <laughs> not being a good director, but I thought it was so much easier than writing. Oh. I was like, you're, you're there and you've already written it. Mm -hmm. So it, it just felt in a weird way, more playful and more fun. I don't know if you've well had that is. experience. But there's so many people watching you. That's the thing. Um, I think waiting. that's the part. I've never done it. I think that's the part, one of the many parts that I would find. I mean, I can isolate some parts of directing that I think I'd be quite good at. Just mm -hmm. naturally working with actors is one of them. But that, that publicness of it. I mean, 
th one of the few things I can honestly say I do love about writing is is that you can be alone and you know you can kind of make a fool of yourself privately. Yeah. And just the uh, the publicness of like I you know even hate that public moment when you first or read a script. You know when you're all first gathered and you're going to hear the script. I, I just feel so exposed at that moment and I feel like I'm going to hear something horrible that I don't want to hear which I inevitably do. I mean I inevitably hear something that I just really bumps me and I can't believe I wrote it mm -hmm. and it just doesn't make sense that it's now it's still, out loud and now it's out loud and it's like what and so it's just like that that's what I really admire that you can do is kind of be in in a you know having the whole crew watching and all the cast watching and and still be calm and making your decisions. I, I mean, know, I don't know how I do it. Was that like just that's just some seriously? Seriously, I, like if I think about it too much, it makes me anxious. All but right, I can. We'll, we'll move off the subject. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can, but I I I'm shocked that I can do it, and I it is, it's very humiliating, but it's worth it. The hu by humiliating. You mean the part where you don't have the answer, but a bunch of people are standing around waiting for you to have the answer? Or um, and do you mean humbling or humiliating? It's sort of a combination of all of it. Like, um, yeah, not having the answer, but I'm okay with that now. I'm pretty okay with that generally. Unless do I'm you have people on a, a set that you can turn to and mm -hmm. say, How, can you help me do oh, this? Yeah. Or do you, you tend to work with the same people over and over? No, I haven't. Producers I have and actors I have. But not the the crew members, no. And not for like a, a variety DP of or reasons, no. But in each situation, I trust that person and feel safe with that person, and I can say, you know, I, uh, you know, like there's a scene in my new movie with um, about 15 uh, people who have Down syndrome, and I was really anxious about shooting this scene, um, and Catherine Keener has to cry in it, and I had to shoot these people and um, take care of everybody and I just said to the DP the cinematographer was like just set up the shot and I'll tell you if it's good or not but I can't even really talk about this the scene was really emotional and I had a lot of people to take care of so no you should always have people like that had you trust. discussed that scene with him before previously oh, yeah, yeah like everything a before. Lot. yeah like so you'd gone through We'd drawn pictures and talked about how we might cover it but it's always different once you're there and Especially meet you know a bunch of people who have special needs and what they're finding out what they're capable of at the last minute stuff like that. Everything I hear about this movie, I'm dying <laughs> to see. Oh, this good. Movie. I, I would officially say that. Um, should we open it up to questions again? Yes. Yes. Could you come a little more in toward? No, the I can't. Oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll even stand up. I'm a teacher. I don't mind. Um, <laughs> I'm very <laughs> curious to know how you structure your writing life because. Um, <laughs> You, this seems like your your stories and your characters could overtake you, and you could be consumed by them on a daily basis. Thinking about you know what would they say, what would they do, how would they interact? No. How do you break away from that? Do you get back into it? Does it ever happen? Has it changed? I'm not as consumed as you might imagine. Um, I. Uh, it's funny. I, I mean, I my writing life. I have short bursts of of writing. I, I don't make myself sit there all day long. It would be I'd just be asleep probably. So I write in the morning for a couple of hours. That's it. And when my kids are in school. Every day or just when you have something that you No, I try to make myself like I'm not doing it now. I finished editing this movie and I'm doing other stuff with the movie and glad to have my life back, but I'm sort of gearing up to make myself sit down every day to work on something for but it, even if it's just a couple of hours, it's usually I get very I'm very concentrated, and I can write many pages quickly. So I'm just so glad when those couple of hours are over, and then I just have my life. When I'm rewriting something for a job, like I get hired sometimes to rewrite a studio movie, I'll write longer because there's a deadline, um, you know, and I have to finish it. But I don't. I used to spend all day more writing and getting more consumed with it. Maybe I'm just more consumed with my kids, and. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm not that deep. Um, I are you consumed? No. <laughs> you just imagined I was. <laughs> so you're not consumed. Are you a writer? 
No, I just I just wondered where the question was coming from. training and that's what I teach and I started writing seriously in the last few years and I find the creative process completely different I'm trying to get my head around it and um, I think that's part of what it is is that I'm trying to figure that part out so I was curious you know uh, this uh, it's one of the those things where nobody can tell you what works for them and have it necessarily apply to you that's one of the things that I th I find is unbelievably challenging and stressful about any artistic enterprise, but I, I can only speak about writing, is I want someone to say, this is how you do it. Like, I, 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 w I, every week we have guests, and I listen so hard, like, what did you do that allowed you to do that mysterious thing that I am still trying to figure out after 25 years? And ultimately, it all comes back to the same thing, which is, boy, trial and error, and you have to figure out what your rhythms are. Mm -hmm. um, and they change over time. Um, Winnie and I both had this thing, this same thing, where it, like, every single day is evaluated based on whether you write or not. You know, you're a good person or a bad person. You wrote, you said you were going to write this much, but you didn't write that much. <laughs> and then you gear yourself up into kind of a state and then you, when you start writing, it's like, I can't stop writing, or this thing is, I'm going to lose this thing, and maybe this thing won't happen again. So this was when I was younger, and writing for hours, and staying up late, and at the time, when you smoke smoking a lot of pot. Oh, I, w I smoked <laughs> cigarettes at first. Write so much better when oh, you smoke. Tell me about it's it. Horrible. I was like, what do you do with your hands when you're not smoking cigarettes? And then I was a big pot, big pot smoker, but only at night. Um, <laughs> That was no, actually. seriously, I mean, I was one of those people that got up in the morning and did it, but e it was like every night, and then when I gave that up, it's like, oh, now what? No, it's Andy. Yeah, except yeah. you can't live your life that way. It's like, you know, it's insane. And then it's talk about falling it. asleep. Yeah. Um, but again, it's like you're, even you will change over time, and it's this, it's like mercury, you know, and it's here, and then it's there, and then it's falling off the table, and it reforms. It's, I wish there was a formula. I wish I could tell me and everyone in this room, you do this, that, and that, and then you'll write. Not only will you write, but it'll get done, and, and then you'll be very happy. happy. What? Nicole's very comfortable not having the answers, and that's fine with me. But I think you quoted Anne Lamott was the best, one of the best things I've heard so far in the last few years is it's, it's okay to write a really shitty first draft. That's, I well, keep, it's that's it's my mantra. mandatory. Yeah. yeah. But I'd never heard that before, you know, before Anne Lamott, so right. that's helpful. It's, if, if I remember, I'm going to try and remember, because I put together a book list last year with, with books like Bird by Bird and things that will speak to some of you but not other ones, but I want to try and remember to bring that in. Anyway, um, yes, question. Hi, Nicole. Love your work. What is your inspiration or, I guess, idea behind Annie's adoption in Lovely and Amazing? Um, it's common now, lots of wealthy people adopt kids and it's not a big deal, but you never hear what happens after they're adopted and the whole thing with the hair, which is true, and a lot of people don't know, you know, stuff like that. Um, Do you have white parents? No, 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 oh. but just in general, like, people don't know, like, the process, like, that takes. And I guess also Jennifer Anderson's character in um, Friends With Money, like, I have people that say these people would never still be her friends and that's not necessarily true if you're friends yeah no I think you know it's not like she's like, like they would never know they would never be friends with the Mexican maid right because that's a whole different culture but this is a white girl who was a teacher who decided to then clean houses temporarily who's you know she's kind of she's a pothead and she's kind of cool and she's still her so I, I believe they would still know her I would still know my friend if, if she did that to make a living it would be fine you know yeah so I, I felt like that was okay. I wouldn't buy it if she was from a whole different world that mm -hmm. they were. And Annie, um, and Lovely and Amazing, is not was not a very imaginative story. My mom adopted a black baby when he was four weeks old. And I just turned that character into a girl mm -hmm. because I wanted the movie to be more about female issues and the hair and how she felt having these white sisters. Um, but I now have a 19-year-old brother who's... Big handsome black guy. 
And he, I'm sure he's going to have a whole host of issues. <laughs> I can't even <laughs> imagine. But he's great. So that was where that came from. Yes? Um, I was going to ask you this on break, but then I thought mm. better to share it. Okay. Um, Catherine Keener, like the sort of love affair you have with her, that she's in all your stuff, like how did that start and then why did it keep going? Um, I saw her in a movie called Johnny Swade, mm -hmm. which I really liked. It's a funny movie. And she just, just that was it. You know, I was looking for somebody to play me, sort of, but also um, just a certain kind of acting that I like. And she's so pretty in such a unique way and um, sparkly and just natural, really natural. And so uh, I found someone who knew her, got to meet her. She went to my gym. Um, and um, see, so it's good you move, live in L.A. This thing sort of happens, right? <laughs> and then uh, we had coffee, and she said she wanted to be in it, and it wasn't until six years later that it was. And, you know, we stayed in touch, not really friends yet. And then I wrote the part for her, for Lovely and Amazing. Mm -hmm. And then Friends with Money, yeah, just kind of thought, oh, she'd be perfect as this. And actually, this last movie, I, I wasn't going to cast her in this part. Because I thought, my movies are so similar in a way. It's kind of time to cast somebody who's really different. And I offered the part to a couple of people who passed and kept trying to think of other people who were as good as her. And it just felt stupid. It's like, I can get Katherine Keener. Why would I, <laughs> you know, put, I don't know, somebody else in it, you know, who's not as good. And it turned out, I mean, I think she's just amazing in it. So fuck that, you know, <laughs> that voice. You know that says I should do something. She she really is incredible, and uh, what I really not every actress can play that part. Who's a little bit of a doormat, like in Walking and Talking. Yeah. You know it. That part could be very like annoying and whiny annoying and, yeah. and whiny and like, yeah. ugh. Yeah. And um and she made her Spirit. so likable uh -huh. and relatable. Um. And she's not like that character at all. She's nothing like Amelia. We've we've seen her now do so many other. Yeah, she's so watchable. Oh, good. You could just watch her do anything. Feel that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love how her thoughts flicker across her face. Mm -hmm. That's really the key, I think, mm -hmm. isn't it, to her charm? So subtle and funny. Yeah, in the so saddest funny. ways. You know, she can be really funny. I'm kind of struck by something you were saying because it's something I think about and struggle with, which is, you know, you were saying that you were kind of torturing yourself about how. Oh, so your movies tend to have a thing about them that are alike, or, um, you know, and of course another word for that is you and I have talked about this is having a style. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. that that could be a good thing, <laughs> you know. And I also kind of go back and forth in my mind struggling with that, like feeling like, um, oh, you know, uh, feeling typecast in a way. And yet I, and I think to myself, I'm really so inside, I'm so, you know, I have all these, things in me and I'm so different but yet the stuff I've done has a has a you know there's like there's a lot of thematic stuff that's the same and it's and there's a lot of other things about it that's the same and I think people would easily pigeonhole me and I don't feel like that inside but then there's another part of me that goes hey it doesn't matter like just keep repeating yourself yeah be, yeah. be more, just do it like I don't know it's just I'm not this is obviously not yet in the form of a question. No, but, but I understand. I mean, people, the last movie I made, um, people were disappointed it was another ensemble. I mean, not, until, not when they actually read it, but like, oh, so who's the lead? Who can we put in the lead? And Catherine is actually the most of the lead in it, but it's still an ensemble, and it's like, I didn't want to write. I tried to write about one character. I did. It's just not your and style, And then she had maybe. some friends. Right. And then she had a mother, <laughs> and then she had a husband, and like before I knew it, it was an ensemble. <laughs> well, because you write, you write about relationships too. But you, sh I should be able to do that with just one character, you know, a lead. But for whatever reason, it's not happening, you know. And it's like I can't beat myself up over over n not doing that. Well, know? I think it's so hard, even if you only do different versions of the same thing, or you have a topic that you're obsessed with or a way that you write it's so hard to be good even at one thing <laughs> that right. you know to me it's like why not lean into your strength because what are your odds you're even going to be good at that i i don't mean you in particular i mean, you mean me. why try i mean you winnie <laughs> no i i i just mean it's hard to be good at 
at anything. Yeah, like I'm not going to try the action movie or the this or the that. It's like, no. I, I mean, I could, I suppose. Y years ago, I don't know. No, never Steve, mind. I'm too what? tired to tell that story. I'm already bored with my own story. I actually want it. I want it. That reminds me of a question I wanted to ask you as you alluded to the fact that you were adapting a novel. Yeah, I did. So you did adapt a novel yeah. into a movie. Yeah. And so was that weird? It was weird. Yeah. So were you happy with your outcome? With yeah. Your script? I couldn't believe it. I mean, it turned out okay. I really didn't know. I got paid to do it, and I really didn't know if I could do it. I mean, how would you know until you've was done it, it? Yeah, yeah. Was it because the novel itself, when you read it, you kind of went, oh, I, I don't know? I mean, did I just didn't know how. You know, I just didn't know how. And so how, did, how did you approach it? I mean, here you're taking this thing on. Again, I, I feel like I never, writing, even if you've done the same way before, you never know how. At least that's my experience. Because you're always starting at the beginning. Um, but how did you approach adapting the novel? Um, I went through the book, and it's very plot-oriented, and so that was easy. That was good. And I, I think I marked the pages that had scenes that I definitely wanted to put in the movie. And um, I wanted to expand on some things, which was kind of fun to do, so I, re I wrote some things that weren't in the book. And then I literally, I put the book up on one of those recipe stands <laughs> and copied it. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? I just turned the page. I see, okay, I'll write this scene now. And I see it, and I turn it into a screenplay. And, and if it was bad, I didn't, you know, if that particular scene didn't work, or I made it longer, or I felt like, um, oh, but I want another scene with the mother character because she needs to be be more developed. I'll write that this happened to her. Did you feel that it was infused with your... Yeah, in, weir in a weird way, yeah. I mean, it's a weird book, too. It's about a two 11-year-old girls who kill a baby. <gasps> Are you kidding me? No, it's disgusting. And <laughs> it's a mystery. It's off screen, the murder. And it's... And they're sad, miserable girls. They don't mean to like torture anybody. It's a sad experience. That is so different from anything. So completely you've different. You've I know. And um, and for that, but it's also it's about how these girls were never mothered properly, and they kind of take this baby, trying to mother it, and it's about their mothers, in it, and um, so it's very me in a way. It's it is the stuff that interests right. me. Right. Because it's about. It's about being a, what I'm being it means to be a mother, I think. And um, I had that uh, angle to draw me in, and that's what I really made it about. Now that I have to direct this, I'm very anxious. Cause oh, you really are going to make this movie? Well, that's supposedly what's supposed to happen. And it's like, I don't want to direct scenes with a dead baby. <laughs> it's like horrible. I can't even watch movies that are about things like that. So well, I don't know. It's quite interesting to see what will happen. Yes. You want to direct those scenes? <laughs> like a proxy? Well, I would love to try directing. I sound kind of fun to me. I don't know. Maybe it's <laughs> just me. <laughs> I'm really? available. You can let a baby cry on the set. <laughs> Make it cry. I, 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 we actually, Wendy Goldman worked on this show with me, and we have this, it was about these people who worked in an advertising agency, Wendy Goldman, okay. my friend over there. And there was a scene where it was like people making a commercial with babies in it. I'm very sorry. <laughs> It was a song from Wicked. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll tell this boring story really fast. So we had all these babies that were supposed to be in like a baby food commercial. So we knew the baby, you know, you, you can't have babies on a set. You know they're going to cry, right? So we're, we, we thought we were being so clever. So we're like, the babies, it'll be a scene about how they can't get the babies to stop crying. You know, so that it's, it's this chaos if they can't get the babies to start crying. But the worst was the babies weren't crying, so we had to make them cry. we had to make them cry. And and like two of them were my the twins of That's my my ex sister in law. No, and she would like you stand out of sight of the baby so that they get really anxious. We weren't pinching them or anything, but we were just like stirring up natural anxiety. It was one of the most stressful days of my life. There was like a room, like a pen with babies in them and their horrible <laughs> parents and oh. Anyway, but good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to call you on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, just 
Seriously, just a little pinch, it'll make them cry. <laughs> just don't change their diaper. Now she's going to start to cry, such and I'm going to say, cut, cut. Yeah, they're like such you, babies. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're really not professional. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do some more questions. Let's. I don't know what it is. Like More questions. Yes. Yeah, I had one. I want to just piggyback on the Catherine Keener, because it, it always, I always wondered, when, uh, you know, because a uh, director, now you're kind of becoming a little synonymous, or she's becoming synonymous with your work. So I'm wondering when, uh, in the hiring process, and you may not know, does that neutralize the actor's price because they've, you know, worked with you numerous times? Do you know? You mean like? Like their fees? Like, in other words, you know, it's, no, it's kind of like. it's always uh, budget dependent. It's always, yeah, okay, yeah. got it. So it's I mean, never like. I would like love to be able to make a movie where we could actually pay her what she deserves. Fair enough. Thank you. you. Know, that would be great. Mm -hmm. But she's, you know. I don't the sport, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she Big wants sport. to be in that movie. Exactly. Yeah. She wants to work with no. Nicole. It's a, pay, it's a trade off because yeah. she's, you it know, stays time. visible, which is nice. Yeah. yeah. But she's actually one of the few actors, though, thinking about it, that really consistently gets good parts. Even in other people's movies, when you can't think of that many actresses, of any age that get consistently get good parts. I know who are also consistently good in the parts, but you can really, yeah. Uh, She's sort of like a character actress in a leading lady body. Yeah, I, um, I have another question, which is one of the things that we read on the internet was that you, when you finish a movie, you don't, you don't, you said you didn't, don't have a lot of ideas. I don't know if it's something that you remember saying or not, but you finish a movie and it's sort of like, I don't, a blank slate. And, and then you, on top of that, you talk about not have, having an outline or even not knowing when a movie is going to end. So how do you know what is an idea that you, That's that is, is, I'm going to sit down now, and this is actually an idea that I'm going to go into this nebulous place with and sit here and see I where it takes me. Trial and error. Like if I have an idea, and I and it lasts a week or two without me thinking it's stupid or or doesn't interest me anymore. Like if I take notes about it and things grow from that idea, then I think I might have an idea for a new movie. I think that's interesting. It's like, in other words, if it starts to progress. It's almost like a now I'm picturing like a little seedling, and it's like you see a little shoot come out from the, from the stem, right? And it's like you're starting to see something. Yeah. Because there's there's issues in my life that I would still like to write about. You know, it's like oh, I never wrote about. I'm making this up. Or like camp, you know. I think oh, there were so many cool things that happened at camp that were so traumatic. But or you're something. making that up. What's a real one? I guess is different. it so horrible to ask you that? Um, no, it's really generic. You know, it's like I'd love to write about my father. You know, my relationship with my father. I haven't really done that. Torn my mother to shreds. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but not my father. And so it's like, yeah, okay. And I sit down and I write about you know five or six incidents that I think would make great scenes, basically. And then the next day, it's like, meh. It didn't, and so it it's didn't, not there yet. It didn't like grow no. into something. Right. Right. Well, maybe but it'll f but it'll it organically be part of something right. else. Yeah. It or could. in two years, or you know, I don't know. But it didn't how stick. How does it, how does your mother is your mother still? So how does that, you know, you just said you tore your mother to shreds. So how does that yeah. and you meant impact on your? Yeah, but I I'm I didn't really mean to torn tear to shreds. I'm kidding. I mean, but I have definitely. But you were referring to lovely and amazing. Yeah. I take it. Yeah. And how does she, how does that impact on your relationship or, She's I mean, I would find it really difficult to write about my mother honestly um, and it, what I would have to deal with right. about that. I've had other relatives not be happy with things um, and I felt pretty bad about it. Um, <clears throat> my mom, I don't know, she was such a good sport. Or she's got a lot of self-esteem. I mean, the character in Lovely and Amazing has a stum a tummy tuck, and my mom didn't. You know, it's made up. So it's not like I was exposing her, although everybody thinks she did. That so was one of the one of my ideas was I, when I was really in the grips of hating my ex-husband when we were going through our divorce. I thought, well, I'm going to write something hmm. 
it, it, and by the way, this plan involved me actually writing something for this. It was like the stupidest plan. But I'm going to write something <laughs> where you can clearly identify him, but then he's going to be like a child molester. So people are like, is he really a child right. molester? Because everything else would be so identifiable. Yeah. But and it was too funny. much effort. Everyone thought that Catherine Keener's husband was my, my ex-husband. I was like, ah, oh, that never happened. And you know, whatever, think what you want. But yeah, you can do it. It's gratifying. My, my, <laughs> my experience with writing my mother is um, I've actually used my mother at, at, you know, in different moments, but in very, what do you call that, you know, guarded ways, disguised. you know, disguised. Mm -hmm. But there was this thing that she had done when she'd come to visit us one, not one Thanksgiving, numerous Thanksgiving, which is that every Thanksgiving when she would come to visit, she would say, you know, like if we were using butter, she would go, well, you know, they're saying now that margarine is really, and if we were using margarine, because I would, the next year I would go, well, mom is really freaked out about butter, uh, uh, so I'll use margarine. And she would go, but you know, they're saying now that if you use butter, it's really, <laughs> and so every time, and I thought it was such a funny thing, and I, I thought, I, I, I was writing a Thanksgiving episode for this TV show, and I thought, Fuck it, you know, I'm just going to use the butter and margarine thing <laughs> because it's so funny to me and I, l I just was fell in love with it and I was really nervous really? because she watched the show all the time and I was totally... And she's not someone who you laugh at no. herself no. with. <laughs> and, um, and I did it and, uh, and, and also the, the actress that, that play <laughs> played the part, it wasn't just the butter and margarine thing, like she was really... She was Pulsive. really a difficult, a, a <laughs> difficult mother uh -huh. in in the script, right. and I really wrote that true, if you know what I mean. And my mom called me up at the end of the episode. Did I tell you this once? Yeah. And she she was like, "I have to tell you, I really don't like that actress who plays the mother. <laughs> <laughs> There's just something about her. I really don't like that woman. Amazing. There's just something about her." And I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> but that was as close as she got. I mean, in other words, she never, she never remembered that we'd had that butter margarine thing. Amazing. And I, so it has become my belief that, even though that's just a little thing, that in my life that I can kind of use things. I actually use something much worse than that. I'm just remembering, but. Um, what? Yeah. Oh, you <laughs> well, in my one feature that I, that uh, got made that is n not really a good movie, but um, what is it? It's not a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say that it's called "Till There Was You," but it, it is it didn't really work out. But um, there is a thing in it w that I absolutely took from my parents, which is that my my parents um, met on at a at a lefty you know socialist people young people uh, kind of getaway camp that they used to have back then in the 40s, you know, outside, up up in the, up yeah, yeah. And they met at a place called Silver Lake Lodge, which was a lefty place to kind of hang out and meet other lefties. <laughs> and um, I, as I understood the story, my father was, uh, my, my, f my mother was charmed because they'd had a ping pong game together and they'd gotten into some sort of argument, very, you know, prefiguring their entire relationship. <laughs> but they'd gotten into some kind of argument in the ping pong game, and she'd felt he'd been very rude, and she walked away. And then later, she was walking on the lake alone, and she saw him coming towards her, and he had picked flowers, and he handed them to her, and she was very, her heart melted, and they later got married. So I had then heard the way you do in, anyway, Jewish families, um, I mean, maybe you know, all families, you know, my father's version of that years later, which was that he had actually picked flowers for another girl that he had <laughs> a, um, and was on his way to find her when he ran into my mother and she mistakenly thought he was apologizing and she... I we thought, uh-oh, now I'm going to have to marry this woman. No. I never, I never use things blatant like that. I mean, I've, I, I just, it hasn't usually happened to me, but I just absolutely s took that mm -hmm. and put that in my movie. And my mother watched the movie many times. She's the one no person who loved it. <gasps> and um, she never, 
was offended. And in fact, I think I have a memory of calling her before it was about to be released because I'd, I'd put off telling her that I used this incident. I wasn't even sure if she ever had heard my father's version of the story. And I, 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 I said all kinds of things like, by then my, my dad was dead, and I said, Mom, you know how, how writers use things that people say, but they change them, and I said, I don't want you. And I went into a long, belabored thing, and she was listening, and she just loved the movie and didn't, so anyway, this is my incredibly long-winded way of saying that I think many times people just cannot, um, they, yeah. just, they, just, they just don't have, have a reaction because they're not, they're somehow protecting themselves in some way and, I mean, wouldn't you say, although you've obviously had the opposite experience. My mom, you know, the stuff in Lovely and Amazing that is so her, she, c I don't know, she, it's not like she's perfect in any way, shape, or form, but she's able to see herself in some way, or she could, she said that she felt, especially because the movie, the ending of the movie is loving, you know, yes. and that ultimately it's loving towards my mom. Totally. You know, and, um. Uh, she said she felt that. But she did have friends say, you know, like, how could you? You want to kill your daughter for, you know, doing that to you in the movie. And she said, no, I, you know, she loves me. And I do. But your mom's also an artist. Well, she's a sophisticated person who gets, gets, right. gets it. You know, she right. does. But Not she that cares we don't about fight constantly in real life. <laughs> but she lets me make movies about her. But she cares about creativity. Yeah. I mean, maybe that, uh, mine, mine is too, actually, come to think of it. I mean, so maybe that's an element of it. Um, so I can't, we can't guarantee that your moms <laughs> will react <laughs> so, 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 care, so lovingly. But you know, what, one comment I wanted to make was, it just it was a thought that I had, is even the story about the revenge fantasy I had about writing that thing, I think something that's charged for you, whether it's a relationship with your mother or your best friend or it uh, it gives you some it gives you some momentum it creates like a a little engine. engine for you to grab hold of and like one of the things that I felt really has driven a lot of my career is anger is is getting fed up and just going fuck everyone I'm gonna just do what I want or just getting you know finding some strong emotion to draw on um, but, uh, yeah, and I find that I go to this, not just anger, but of yearning to be... Um, accepted. Accepted. I was going to say different than I am, but it is yearning to be accepted. Um, but those are really strong emotions for me. So, you know, you just use that to create a little friction. Um, yes? Okay, so I had a question about your, your evolution as a writer, having also been a director and also a television director. So I was particularly curious, you did some time, I guess, directing Six Feet Under and Gilmore Girls after you did this movie and then before the other ones, if I read the bio correctly. So I'm curious to know, as, as you've evolved, how that experience And Sex in the City, too. Yeah, and Sex in the City, too. You know, if you enjoyed it, if you found that it helped you grow as a director, and also if it helped you grow as a writer. I, some of that writing is such incredible dialogue. I feel like it's actually influenced like a lot of other TV shows, it's actually influenced feature writers in terms of dialogue yeah. is in, and how you hear dialogue in movies like, I can't help but, this may be completely wrong, but I can't help but thinking Gilmore Girls almost in, in made the world ready for something like Juno, where maybe if, if Gilmore Girls hadn't happened, Juno wouldn't have been the way that it was, or maybe not, I don't know, but, so I'm just curious how that whole experience was for you and if you enjoyed I'll it. I'll do and it, it fast. Really um, I did enjoy well. it very much, not all the time. Um, I only a actually directed one Gilmore Girls, and that was not fun. This is on tape, though. It is, but again, very few people will. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all right. I'm allowed I not to have fun that. sometimes, right? Um, otherwise, it can be very fun. Sex and the City and Six Feet Under were great. And um, I got Sex and the City after I did Walking and Talking, but it was also a, a show nobody knew anything about. And... Um, it was the first season. Two in the first season. Three's a crowd. And, uh, uh. Is Three's a crowd the one where th Miranda wants to be, there's a, th yeah. like, the everybody wants to, to be have in a threesome, threesome, but not, 
They don't. Or nobody ask wants Miranda. Miranda, so she puts an ad in the paper or something. That's, that's yeah. a great. Yeah, that's that a one. great episode. Of, and then yeah. one other in the first season, which I can't remember. And oh, it was called the Bay of Married Pigs. <laughs> and then in the I then like the third or fourth season, I did no ifs, ands, or buts, where she tries to quit smoking, and she meets Aiden. And that was a great episode too. That was fun. And then no oh, sands or butts and I forgot. And I, so you know what? I um I've worked with Darren Starr and he's a friend of mine. So when I knew you were coming, I sent him an email and oh. you know, just again part of the research when I can't just pull stuff off yeah. the internet. And he's like, I love Nicole. She she's makes directing look as easy as eating um yogurt. <laughs> Frozen yogurt. If you like yogurt. That's no, so but nice. you know, it was like so nice. God, that's so nice. I have a good time doing it. People say I don't look as stressed as I feel, which is fine. Well, that's, that's a good lot. because that's you're a big deal, though. Yeah. I mean, because you're, people are looking to you yeah. on the set. No, I look pretty correct? relaxed. Yeah. I don't know how. That does set the tone, no? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Because it should be I fun. I feel relaxed just I sitting here talking to you. Good. It I should do. be fun, you know? It's just a movie, and it's just a TV show. And, I mean, there's times, actually, on the Gilmore Girls, like, when I, I felt I had to really prove myself, Ugh, I could just do act like an idiot, you know, I think. And and then that just builds on itself, you well, know? Yeah, that's probably where the question came from, because you're a very specific type of director, it sounds like, in terms of your process, and a writer, but you're, you're coming from a very sort of personal process approach, and going into a TV show where, you know, you're there for one episode, that's yeah, a, such hard. a different kind of a world. It is, but it, it depends on the vibe. All those TV shows, I mean, Six Feet Under was already established, and um, I was already a huge fan of the show. I couldn't even believe I was standing, like, in the on the set, you know? It's like, this is their kitchen, oh, my God. And the actress was looking at me like, she's the director. <laughs> it's like, I swear, I'll tell you what to do really soon. And, um, but that, you know, if they're nice people, and basically, you just try not to wreck the show. I don't. I don't need to make my own imprint on there. I just want to make it the best episode that is invisible as the director. Um, so yeah, I got offered those jobs after the movies, and um, I was great in a couple of pilots. And uh, I haven't done any in a long time. I just did two. Um, uh, one was called Timing and Space in a later season where. Um, I think his name was George uh, Cromwell. Uh, you know, um, what's his name? Jamie, Jamie Cromwell. Cromwell. James Cromwell uh, goes bananas and starts sleeping in the bunker. Oh. <laughs> and that might. And then one where where Nate is trying to get his baby back. You know, Lily Taylor's baby. Is that a different episode? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. We're all somewhat memory challenged here. Yeah. Um, as soon as I walk out there, I'll remember. Should, we'll take one last question. You know what? Tommy in space and if the mom shelter. Oh, what's her name's funeral's father? Rachel. What was her? Rachel, Rachel Griffiths. Griffiths. Brenda's father dies, and it's the funeral. And Nate has brain cancer. And oh. Kill. So we'll, this will be our last question. Yeah. Can I answer your question. Oh. Well, I was wondering, um, one of the things I noticed as I was watching was sort of the, the way in which you, um, you str well, structure, you say you don't, but um, one of the things I noticed was just how quickly you set something up and then pay it off almost in like at least two or three scenes. Yeah. And it's very similar to how Woody Allen does his movies also. It's a very kind of comedic thing, and I'm wondering to what extent you um, maybe like light comedy or stand-up comedy or you watch that or how... No, not at all? No, I mean, I'm a huge Woody Allen fan, and I grew up watching them, like you all should have, too. <laughs> um, you could know, the good be, ones. Could be a strong influence on your work. Definitely. Yeah. Just like as any fan, you know, watching something, I mean, Annie Hall and Manhattan and all that stuff, definitely an influence. And I do, my instinct is to go funny. You know, even if it's getting dramatic, I, I want to put something funny in there. But it's not... Um, it's not something I think of. It's just a, a natural um, rhythm, I guess. But you've been inspired by those movies. I mean, clearly, by some Probably, of those. Probably, yeah. Do you but I'm not copying their, or, or like, I'm aware, oh, I've got to pay this off now. No, you've got an internal rhythm, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah. And you also, 
uh, it's a directorial thing, but it almost feels like you've got some sort of feeling like something needs to happen. Or just like in life where something happens and then it feels like, oh, this is such a weird coincidence because now it's coming back here. And I think it's partly what makes it seem lifelike. It could just as easily make it seem written, but it also makes it seem lifelike. Um, so this, I w before I say thank you to Nicole, which I'm going to say in one second, if people are going to be here next week, just hang out for one second afterwards, and I'll tell you everything I don't know about how to get the material next week. But I'll fill you in on where we're at with that. But um, this was incredible. This was thank really you so incredible. much. It's fun. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much.